next up, we've been talking, I think it's a really interesting uh, segue there, because um, uh, Dr. Viega has been talking about um, attention doesn't matter unless it leads to something. No one advertises just to get attention, it's to change people's behaviours and change people's minds. And this is something that's been forcefully argued by, by uh, Ian Edwards uh, uh, over quite some time now and in a series of really interesting articles in WARC. And it was on that basis that Ian and I have been talking about it, about this, the impact of attention, the fact that attention is useless until it leads somewhere, which is something that Facebook are very, very interested in. So a hand for Ian Edwards, please. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and yeah, also, well, I, I start by saying it's fabulous to be in front of an audience again, but um, slightly surreal with all the headphones on. Um, and I'm also aware that I'm going to have to fight quite hard for your attention. Uh, the second day of conference and the post-lunch slot, and I'm sure a few sore heads after the football last night. Um, and so, yeah, today, if you give me your attention, hopefully I'm going to give you some insight into how we think about it and how attention can deliver outcomes for advertisers. Um, I want to sort of start by addressing the elephant in the room. I'm going to talk about the attention economy um, and how advertising works in its broadest sense. Um, but clearly, I work for Facebook and have a bias um, towards Facebook. But I'm very conscious of that bias. Uh, and hopefully, by being aware of that bias, as with all biases, um, I can address that and give you something that is uh, valuable to you, uh, no matter what your business, uh, no matter what your brand, or the uh, space of marketing that you work in. Um, and also, just to clarify, the, my role at Facebook and the connection planning team, our role is to look at the 200 million businesses that have a page on Facebook, and the 10 million of those businesses that advertise, and look at how we turn that attention that we've collected into valuable outcomes um, for those businesses. Um, and what I think is, um, is, 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 well, actually, before I do that, I actually wanted to, to start with a, a, a short apology where this has come from. Um, Mike has been incredibly generous in inviting me to speak here today, and I wrote an article in response to the Lumen paper, which had this line that said, the blunt comparison of attention as a purely time-based commodity will push our industry backwards. Um, now, I want to apologize for that. And also, I think that it hasn't pushed the industry backwards. Um, quite clearly, by looking at all the people here on the attention stage today, it started a really interesting debate where we can start to unpick some of these challenges. So it started something that I think is really interesting, and I'm very grateful for you to give us the opportunity. Um, but, and there is a big but, um, and I've, you know, Madfest is about being a little bit provocative. And today, you know, I want to unpick some of those things that had frustrated me slightly and why I wrote that, that, that article. And at the very core of that is this idea that digital algorithmically driven media, so media that is driven by an algorithm that determines which ads to serve to which people, are fundamentally different to traditional channels, which start with an audience, where you buy an audience. And that is a critical distinction which we need to play out and play through in this research if we're really going to understand how attention works in advertising and how that drives value for businesses. You know, I think actually, slightly, 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 slightly strange context to follow this, the session before, but it makes the point that this is critical for us to get right at the moment. Um, you know, we've seen that mobile, in terms of time spent and the media day, if you look at the latest IPA touch points report, you can see that, mo that mobile phones have taken now the largest share in 2020 in terms of the attention economy over, over TV, so I overtook that for the first time. And then what we've also seen from the IPA touch points report is that algorithmically driven media, so media like Facebook, like Instagram, uh, like Netflix, has overtaken traditional channels in terms of time spent. Um, and in and that, that, was, that was done, you know, overtaken for, for 18 to 34 year olds a couple of years ago. And last year it moved up to older audiences, so 35 to 54 year olds. Now that is absolutely critical. One of the longest established principles of marketing effectiveness, you know, a decade and a half ago, I can't believe that the, 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 this was written a decade and a half ago, uh, when Les Burnett and Peter Field published Marketing in the Era of Accountability. And apologies, there's lots of people at the back and this is quite a small chart. But this is, that, this is the model which explains the, rep, uh, the relationship between share of voice and your share of market. 
And what the model shows is that there is a very, very strong and causal link between those two factors. So your share of market, if you want to maintain your share of market, you should have a share of voice that lands on that, on, on that line there. So there's a very strong relationship. If you overinvest and have extra share of voice over your share of market, your business will grow. Uh, and if you underinvest, you would expect your business to decline in size. That relationship is critical um, and it still stands true today. And essentially with mobile taking such a large chunk of the media day, we simply have to understand how the attention that's delivered through mobile can build brands. Because if you don't, and your competition do, you're essentially only playing with two thirds of the media day. Your share of voice is already gonna be compressed. And those businesses that do understand how to turn that share of voice on mobile platforms and build brands uh, will, will, will start to see growth. So that was why it's important now. Now, I'm sure probably no one here has read all of the interaction that myself and Mike have had and all the, the, the conversations, but there's lots of backwards and forwards. And I think there are some areas that we agree on um, and there are some areas that, you know, are complicated. And, um, you know, I want to, I'm going to dive into those. The first one um, that I think, you know, everyone here I'm sure agrees on is that attention matters. It clearly matters. Um, and achieving some attention for your marketing activity is critical. Um, how much that is, you know, we'll come to see. The second one is that attention is not an objective. Okay, that's really important. And I think attention being an objective, time spent becoming an objective, is in places becoming conflated. Um, it is a measure, it is an output, it is not an outcome or an objective. I think when we talk about this in detail, we should probably all agree on that, and I'll, I'll, I'll unpack that a little bit further. Um, the next one is that there is one type of attention on any given particular media channel. Um, and I'm thinking particular platforms, obviously, like Facebook and Instagram. I'm going to unpack that. It's more complex than this, um, and we need to talk about it. The last one I think that's really interesting is that quite a lot of the research that I've seen today um, you know, it feels quite sort of combative. It makes it feel like media planning is, is essentially a binary choice, that we're picking one channel over the other channel. What we've known for decades is that combinations kind of work best. So it is not, it is not a choice between two channels and just picking one. It is the combinations that are critical. And what's interesting is brand is not one thing. I'm going to share some work from Oxford University. Um, but this idea that we're building brand it, we have to move beyond that. It being one thing is just simply not true and it's not effective uh, if you just try and shift all brand measures with one single campaign. So let's talk about this. This one quite quickly and you know, th I celebrate a lot of the work that's happening in terms of that, the, the relationship between attention and effectiveness and outcomes. This was published by the Ehrenberg Bass Institute made famous by uh, you know, Professor Byron Sharp. Um, it shows that attention you know, is critical but it's a non-linear relationship. And lots of the work is moving into that to understand where that trade-off kind of happens. And you know, having a media agency background, you know, those curves, anything that curves, and there are no straight lines in advertising, things don't continue to improve all the time. No straight lines I mean it's absolutely critical. We start to see where value is delivered, for which outcome, um, and that will help us plan more effectively. Um, so we can all agree on that, thankfully, I think, hopefully. The second one, which I think is, 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 is a little bit more complex, but I think when we look at the research, people start to understand you know, why we need to stop conflating a tension as an objective or as an outcome. Um, and I, you know, I think if we go to uh, Goodhart's law, um, which we, you know, the economist uh, Goodhart who came up with this, he wasn't, definitely wasn't talking about advertising at the time, um, but I think it absolutely rings true with what we see on our platforms. And what Goodhart said was when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. What that means is that if we make, in the, the, the context of advertising, if we make attention, time spent, a target, it is open to be gained and we lose sight of the outcome. Now, quite simply, if, you know, as Jerry Dakin, who I think is a very, very wise marketeer, often points out, if you want people to watch your ads for longer, put cats or cute animals or children in them and they will watch for much longer. You can gain the system, you can get more seconds of attention by doing those things, pulling those levers, yeah? But what that doesn't do is translates to any business outcome. 
you've just got more attention. So we have to stop talking of attention as an objective in its own right and look at it as a measure, a KPI. And, you know, this is again, you know, I think what's, what's good here is this debate, you know, brings back lots of the really um, established principles around marketing. You know, this was again, this is a framework I've used for my entire career. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's, it's one that we need to again, like really lean into. So you essentially have an input, so your investment, you have an output, how many people are you reaching? How many people are you buying? Your output is also the attention, the amount of time that people are spending with it. Um, then you have outtakes. How has that changed how someone thinks and feels about your brand? You know, things like awareness, consideration, motivation. How has it changed the perception that person has about your business? And then ultimately the outcome. How does that change in perception ultimately translate to a change in behavior? You know, things like long-term value uh, and sales. It's critical that we move as far across as we possibly can if we want to get the attention of the CMO, investors, um, and you know, fi you know, the financial markets, the finance director. You know, those are the things that they really care about. We need to move across. And I'm you know, delighted to see the previous presentation making some links towards sales. But what I also think is critical when we make that change is that we look at this in the real world. I think modeling is fantastic and it's very, very useful because it's easy to do. But what we need to start to do, and you know, the biggest step forward is our ability to measure more precisely in 2021. Um, and you know, what we can start to do you know, on digital platforms is we can create randomized groups. So we can create a randomized control group and a randomized experimental group who are exposed and non-exposed to advertising. And then we can tra track that through um, in terms of the changes in their um, outtake, their perception, so we can do brand lift, and their outcome, their actual buying. Um, and we need to make sure any models that we create, we calibrate with the real world, critical. Then the, the third one, which I think is, it, it, it's a really exciting time in media. I mean, just walking around today, there's so many opportunities coming at people. Really different formats, really different technology being created. But the point here is that, you know, on digital platforms, it is not one type of attention. There is a huge variation, and we are continuously building new products. And I know we don't make your life easy as, as, as brands and as media agencies, creative agencies, because we're constantly introducing new formats. But it's kind of what people want. Um, and you know, if I was to very, very greatly simplify Facebook uh, and our apps and services today, there are kind of two types of attention that you get. You get the kind of longer form video, which is great for building deeper connections. So things like Watch, which is our, our video platform. If you're watching video on Facebook, you're watching Watch. Um, I often say it's the, um, it's the biggest brand building platform that you have never heard of um, because you know, it, 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 is, it is very new. But that's essentially quality publishers putting content on there. Um, and if they hit very stringent standards, they can monetize so you can run in-stream ads. We've got IGTV and we've got things like live. Huge differences in terms of the duration uh, and time that people spend. Then, you know, the other side of Facebook is that you have the short form. So you have the longer form, more engaged content, and you have the shorter form. You know, a much, much bigger audience, feed and stories of what people traditionally do, uh, Instagram reels. These are, you know, moments where people are spending time and the ads are interspaced between different content. That shorter form is, is great for driving reach, great for driving top of funnel measures. It's also incredibly valuable for driving performance. Um, using signals to reach people when they're in market, they're not looking at specific content, they're in this discovery mindset. So they will see an ad, if they're in market, they will then follow it through. That, you know, those are the two main types. And then just to ladder on top of that, if that kind of wasn't enough, is we are constantly building these new formats. You know, we've got Watch, as I said, you know, Facebook was nominated for eight Emmys, won one Emmy in terms of the original content that was produced, longer form programming, live, we've seen people like Defective Records go from in-person festivals um, to reaching millions of people. They actually, in their, in their campaign when they pivoted during lockdown, they went from in-person festivals to running a Friday night live broadcast which reached people in 93 different countries globally. Seven million people in 93 countries, so really interesting. We've got... Oh, let me go back. 
We've got augmented and virtual reality. We believe that augmented reality is the next computing platform and it's going to fundamentally change the way that people interact with technology over the next 15 years. It's in its infancy at the moment, but lots of interesting opportunities. A uh, really interesting example there from Opal, where if the video had played, you could see that people were placing the car on their drive and interacting in a much deeper way. And then virtual reality. You know, this isn't at mainstream yet, but that experience of being immersed in a world is a huge opportunity for brands. And we saw Balenciaga uh, launch their, their, their fashion show by sending out Oculus sets to people and giving them this unbelievably deep and rich experience. Very different type of attention, very different type of performance. Um, and what we find is it's not one or the other necessarily, but actually having a blend of both of these, short form and longer form, that drives business outcomes. Um, and you know, we see that actually there's a 1.5x improvement in ad recall by adding an in-stream um, and a 20% cost uh, drop in um, a 20% drop um, in cost per ad recaller. So mixing those things together is, is really interesting. But the platforms are different and this is, this is the critical point that I kind of want to get across. I know it's quite technical um, but the difference is that platforms like Facebook start with an objective rather than an audience. In the system when you buy, how many people here have brought a campaign on Facebook actually been in and set one up? So quite a few people. When you go in, you pick the objective, you tell the system what you want to achieve. And they range from things like awareness, um, so increasing your brand awareness, reach, um, to consideration, driving video views, right the way through to conversion. You tell the system what you want to do, and then the algorithm goes out and finds people who are more likely to partake in that specific behavior that is going to drive, uh, uh, drive value for your business, the outcome that you want. So the big difference is it starts with an objective, not an audience. Ooh. And, you know, I wrote this. This is a line that I do stand behind. And I said, you know, this, I want to unpick this chart a little bit. And what we see is if you, are, if you select a DR campaign, so a, a web conversion campaign, uh, and you want to compare that on video views, the equivalent is it's like getting a Formula One car and entering it into a tractor pulling competition. Yeah? It basically, it can kind of do the job, but it's not doing what it's designed to do. And I do compare you know, Facebook ads to a Formula One car. We have many thousand of the world's best engineers thinking about how to make our advertising more effective and deliver the specific outcome. And we need to start to pull that apart. And I'm sorry, I don't know if there's people from a bit here, but I do just want to unpick and like a little bit of this, this piece of research, which is one of the most widely shared. What it says here, for those at the back, is that cost per impression along there um, going up and, and, and seconds of attention going up here. Um, and you know, what you can see there in this example is that Facebook feed is about the same price as TV, but the difference in cost per second is, is hugely different. The challenge, and I know we've talked a lot to Mike about this, is that the costs were going in based on a blend of one advertiser's, all, all their campaigns from one advertiser, and you're mixing in DR and brand objectives. You can do this comparison, you just need to, to measure it against video views and use those costs per thousands. Otherwise, you are taking you know, what I think is a very sophisticated ad platform uh, and essentially using it in the tractor pulling competition. Um, and you know the other thing that we, yeah, the other thing that you will notice there is that Instagram's significantly cheaper than Facebook. You should not be breaking out the two platforms. They should be working together uh, and allowing the systems to deliver to reach the broadest audience. Two really critical, critical differences if we're going to start to turn this attention into value. So it's a complex topic on those three. And then the last one that I just wanted to touch on is this this this, this fact that it's not a binary choice, um, and the fact that it's the blends of attention that are critical. Um, this, uh, this, this is an interesting quote. Again, I'm using lots of old theory here, um, which came from the, this Oxford paper that's recently been published with no silver bullet. Um, it starts with this quote, marketing is an art, and the marketing manager, as head chef, must creatively marshal all of his, marshaling, his marketing activities to advocate the, the short and long-term interest of the firm. You know, essentially, back in the 60s, the, ch the chief marketing officer was a chef that was bringing together lots of different channels and different opportunities to drive the sh short and long-term um, objectives of his company. You know, I would argue that back then it was kind of meat and two veg, and probably now it's a little bit more cordon bleu cooking. Um, that's, that's, that's my marketing joke for the day. I'll, I'll leave you with that. Um, but, you know, we need to start to understand how those two things kind of work together, how different channels work together. Um, Oxford, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail. It's hot, 
I am a little hungover, um, and this is a very, very long, dense academic paper, but I did want to summarise it. It's, um, it was the largest ever academic study into cross-media brand effects, a thousand campaigns with an average spend of 12, uh, 12 million dollars, 13 billion of media investment over 10 years, lots and lots of channels. It's a huge, huge study, 557 brands, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Worth a look. There's a summary article on the WARC website, but you can also go to the Side Business School's website and download the report as well. Um, and what they did is they took all of those, you know, 1,000 plus campaigns and looked at the media channel and effectively ran it a little bit like a stock market. What was the objective that it was trying to achieve? What was the different equities that you were buying in those different media channels? And how effective was it at driving the particular outcome that it was designed to move? What they found was kind of nine clusters, you know, awareness, top of mind awareness, through to motivation, through to association, uh, consideration. So there were nine clusters that they anal analyzed. Um, and the results, I think, were really interesting. They found that, on average, by changing the mix, changing the different channels that you were using, um, could drive a 2.5x improvement in your effectiveness. A huge, huge return from changing the balance. Um, you know, good thing I spent, you know, first, first 15 years of my life as a, as a comms planner at media agencies. You know, the craft of planning is still so critical, getting those combinations right. Um, and the key findings was that, you know, and I think the, sometimes with academic papers, it, the, there's some quite profound insight that's a little bit buried in the language. But I think, you know, one for me was this idea that when you look across those nine clusters, pursuing multiple different outcomes with the same campaign is highly unlikely. You know, and I would challenge this idea of mental availability. You know, Byron Sharp, I have a signed T-shirt from Byron Sharp. I had a T-shirt and I asked him to sign it. I am an absolute fan of the Ehrenberg Bass Institute, but this concept of... Um, I'm not sure why I just said that on stage, actually. Um, but this concept of having um, what one thing that is all brands is a challenge. Are you trying to drive top of mind awareness, Coca-Cola, you know, everyone knows you, you're just trying to remind and refresh people. Are you driving consideration? Are you driving association? You know, we've got the Euros on. Are you a sponsor in the Euro? Driving say, you need a different strategy and a different channel mix to do those outcomes. And we need to change the way that we plan to focus on that. Brand is not one thing, it's a common mistake. Um, TV is effective as the bedrock to these campaigns, but it shouldn't dominate the plan. Are you over-investing? Uh, and they identified a 50% cutting point where you shouldn't invest more than 50% of your budget. And likewise, you shouldn't invest overly in one particular channel. Um, so if you invest too heavily in one or two channels, that is also a poor way to drive effectiveness. You know, I think we need to just drop the term digital, really. You know, this idea of traditional versus digital from a planning perspective is, 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 is actually, you know, it's, they, 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 we, we need to kind of move away from that. What I would challenge on that, though, is we, under, we need to understand the nuance of how the different types of media operate to, to, to kind of move us forward. But digital, you know, it's media. They're all medium. Um, and then the final one, which I do think is quite profound, is exploiting different uh, lengths of attention, different durations and different types of attention, bringing those things together is profoundly powerful. So, you know, attention, a critical topic, is the first step in, in channel planning. I think we need to recognise that uh, attention, you know, we're seeing the, this effectiveness CPM coming out. The, when, we're, when we're looking at just pure duration, it's not effectiveness. It's an input and we need to do more work to make sure that we're linking that through to those outcomes. But it's a good first driver. And I just wanted to close with a couple of thoughts, right? A lot of the work that's happening at the moment reminds me of you know, the behaviourist movement in psychology where you had stimulus response. And um, the, the godfather of that, Skinner, uh, said that he denied, you know, you, if you can't observe, you can't observe what's going on in people's heads, and if you can't observe it directly, it kind of doesn't exist. And that stimulus response idea is kind of, I think, sometimes similar with, to where we are with some of the attention work. The thing that we need to think about is, you know, what is going on inside people's heads? And if a brand is a collection of associations formed in the mind of a consumer, what can psychology tell us about levers that we can pull to make those associations a little bit more effectively? The first thing that I, you know, I absolutely believe this, and I think, again, is, 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 is critically important, is you know, Stephen Pinker wrote this book back in 1996 called, and, and called The Blank Slate. The human brain is not a blank slate. It is not a tape recorder. It does not rec record reality equally uh, based on time. 
um, and uh, the attention that it's received. It just doesn't do that. We filter out so much stuff. And what's interesting is the inputs that go into your mind, what goes in through your senses, uh, is fundally, fundamentally different to what comes out. The experiencing self is different to the remembering self. Now, this won't happen in this football tournament because England are going to win, um, clearly. But, you know, what, what, the, 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 the analogy that Daniel Kahneman uses is imagine yourself going to a concert, beautiful classical music, amazing. It's absolutely brilliant. At the end, a fire alarm goes off for 10 seconds. When you're asked about that concert going forward, the reality was that you have one hour, 59 minutes and 50 seconds of beautiful music. But what you remember was the fire alarm that went off right at the end. The remembering self is very different. And you know, I often think about that, my experience of not Euro 96, England crashing out. I don't remember all the fabulous wins and all those things before. I kind of remember that last penalty, um, that crashing out, and it's you know, kind of the screech effect. So understanding how the brain processes information and forms associations is a huge opportunity, not just the inputs. Now, I did debate putting this in, but I went to, I went to an academic conference. Anyone with a bit of algebra for a Thursday afternoon before you get stuck in back down to the bar? Um, and I went to, went to a conference in, on associative learning, and it was nothing to do with advertising. But some of the academic, and this is why I absolutely believe that we need to get closer to academics um, in terms of the work that they're doing, talked around the equation for associative learning. How many people have heard of Pavlov's dogs? Pretty much everyone. Um, so for those few people that hadn't, Pavlov's dogs was this idea that you ring a bell and you associate that with food, uh, and then over time the bell becomes associated with the food, uh, and the dog starts to salivate at the sound of a bell. It's an association that's formed between two random stimulus. I spent quite a lot of time going through this when I didn't have a hangover, and um, looking at the equation. It's actually quite simple, and I think there's some really profound implications for advertising in how those associations are formed. Essentially what it says is the associative, associative strength between two stimulus, so a brand, product, and would be a good analogy of that, is a factor of the salience times the payoff um, times the outcome minus the expectation. That's quite a lot to get, two minutes here, cool. Uh, that's quite a lot to get your head around. But if we think, you know, when, the, when this was presented to me, they took a bell and then they took a blue piece of paper. You can form associations between anything. Brains are incredibly good at forming associations. So the bell is very salient, short duration, but very salient. The blue piece of paper, which was associated with food, not so salient. Yeah, give it a factor of eight, factor of two, just to bring this to life. The payoff, quite big, food, you know, that's a great, that's a good payoff. The expectation, when you see a blue piece of paper or a bell, is very low. There's not a lot of expectation there. But the outcome is amazing. The surprise factor is amazing. And by following those principles through, you can see that you get an incredibly different level of association being formed. As I said, you know, the paper can form the associations lots more frequencies. Probably why outdoor is a good channel with very, very high frequency when you're buying it. Um, cinema, lower frequency, you know, it's, it, 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 these things stand up in there. Um, but they, they're very different. I think there's some really powerful, this powerful concept about beating expectations being surprising. And the last book that I would encourage you to read, a thousand, it's called A Thousand Brains by Jeff Hawkins, which came out earlier this year, which builds on this kind of model. It basically says that our brains are constantly looking around to predict what's kind of going to happen. We have this mental representation, and we really attend to things that are out of sync, unexpected, what jumps out to us. I do think digital media is a huge opportunity for brand advertisers. Yeah, because there's a great opportunity to surprise, delight, be unexpected and feed. The Big Ben there, you've probably heard if you have Facebook talk before, the, on the average day, people scroll through, people, the average person on Facebook scrolls through 300 feet of news feed, the equivalent of Big Ben. That's a lot of news feed. In that, you're not task driven, you're not looking for anything, you're in this discovery mindset. Most of that's friends and family and people posting stuff on Facebook. So if you have the craft of advertising, um, so you, hopefully that's just played behind me. Uh, my favourite campaign of the last, last few weeks. Just I love the craft of this KFC example. If you use the craft, you're competing with just people who are posting stuff. You can surprise and delight people in that news phase. They jump out and beat their expectations. 
And you could do this really, really quickly. And you could do this emotionally. Uh, my favorite campaign, the Dove Courage is Beauty campaign, I just think is absolutely mesmerizing. Big winner at Cannes. Uh, very simply changing Dove Real Beauty to Courage is Beauty and showing the uh, faces of frontline workers um, is, a, a, is a campaign. A powerful, emotive, very quickly told sound off story. Um, so just to kind of wrap up, um, I know I've talked a little bit and it's been quite complicated. Unlocking the value of attention. There are a few things that we absolutely need to do. Unlock and we need to remember attention is not, um, is not a target, it's an output. Um, we need to always calibrate whatever models we are creating with the real world. Models are great, but we've got to calibrate with what's happening in the real world. Brand is not one thing. Be specific with what you are trying to achieve. Um, creative is your biggest effectiveness driver. And with that point, surprise, delight, and inspire your audience with the unexpected in whichever channel you're using. I just show Facebook. Um, so with that, thank you very much, and thank you again, Mike, for the opportunity. <laughs>